The first of the basic rules we're going to cover is the negation rule. We're given an event A, and we know the probability of A occurring. Call this P of A. Question, what is the probability that A will not occur? This is P of not A. The rule is simple. Given P of A, the probability that A will occur, or that A is true, the probability of A not occurring, or not being true, is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. Here's a simple example. We know that the probability of rolling a 2 on a 6-sided die is just 1 in 6. Our space of possible outcomes has 6 elements in it, and the outcome that we care about is just one of those elements. So the ratio is 1 in 6. Now, what's the probability of not rolling a 2? Well, this is just the probability of rolling a 1, or a 3, or a 4, or a 5, or a 6. Anything that's not a 2. This includes 5 of the 6 possible outcomes, so the probability is 5 in 6. But note that 5 in 6 is just 1 minus 1 in 6, or 1 minus p2, the probability of rolling a 2. If that's not clear, just remember that 1 is equal to 6 over 6. So 6 over 6 minus 1 over 6 equals 5 over 6. Now when you look at the sets of numbers in the curly brackets at the bottom here, you notice something interesting. These sets represent what is sometimes called the sample space of this experimental setup, the set of all possible elementary outcomes of a random trial. Notice that the events A and B can be represented by subsets of this sample space. Let's make this clearer. The event of rolling a 2 is represented by the single element of the set. The event of not rolling a 2 is also represented by a subset of the sample space. In this case, the remaining five elements. In set theory language, we'd call the set on the right the complement of the set on the left. The general point is that given a space of possible outcomes, you can represent an event A as a subset of that space, and the negation of A, not A, is represented by the complement of that set, all the members of the space that are not A. And when you can join these sets together, you recover the whole sample space because A and not A partition the sample space into two parts with nothing left over. So when you put the parts back together, you get the whole space back. We can generalize this point graphically. First, let's set up a convention that is often used to graphically represent probability relations. I find it really helps to develop your intuition about these relationships. This only works for certain kinds of sample spaces, but it's still very helpful. Let's represent the total sample space, the complete set of possible elementary outcomes by a square. We'll call it omega. We'll set the area of this sample space equal to 1. Now, when we do this, different events, different possible outcomes, can be represented by subsets of this area, and the probability of those events will be proportional to the area of the subsets. So let event A be represented by this area. The probability of A is proportional to the area of this subset. The larger the area, the more probable the event. If the area of A includes the whole sample space, omega, then the probability would be 1, that event would happen with certainty. In general, this will be a number less than 1. So how do we represent not A on this diagram? Well, not A is just the complement of A. It's the fraction of omega that is not in A. And it looks like this. It's all this light blue area. So from this setup, we have a graphical version of the relationship we've been describing. A and not A partition the sample space into two parts with no overlap and no remainder. The area of one is one minus the area of the other. Now from this we can see a couple of useful relations. First, as we've seen, when we conjoin or take the union of A and not A, we recover the whole sample space, which has probability 1. This simply involves adding up the areas, and they fit together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. This schema shows us how to think about the probability of any event or proposition and its negation, even ones that are hard to assign a numerical measure to. For example, if A is the proposition that is going to rain tomorrow, and we think this has a 75% chance of being true, then according to this rule, we're compelled to assign a probability of 25% to the proposition that it won't rain tomorrow. This is a consistency constraint on how we're supposed to reason with probabilities as defined in standard probability theory. If we don't do this, then we're not following the rules of standard probability theory. If you break this rule where standard probability is known to apply, like when you're at the roulette wheel or playing cards, then you'll just be in error. You'll misjudge the probabilities of complementary events. The last thing I want to point out is that this rule builds in a rule of standard formal logic, which is known as the law of the excluded middle. The law of the excluded middle says that for every proposition A, either A is true or its negation is true. There's no third truth value that A could have. 
Now, it's an interesting fact that there are logical systems and mathematical systems that reject this law. There's no room to go into those here, but I just wanted to point out that there are interesting relationships between probability theory and logic. But we're doing standard probability theory here, and it won't pay to get too distracted, so for the most part I'll be ignoring these possible digressions.